there is a worldwide shortage in software engineers. 77% of Silicon Valley firms report difficulty finding technical talent. And imagine if it's that difficult in Silicon Valley, which has a net influx of engineering talent, it's very difficult in the rest of the world. This affects all of us, not just software companies. It is the innovation that these software engineers bring that helps drive our economy, that helps people to communicate at a distance. Software engineers bring advances in medicine, for example, through DNA analysis, and they help bring online education to developing nations. As we've seen recently in the Middle East, software engineers and the work that they do can help spur revolution against oppressive regimes. The shortage in software engineering talent is very important. My name is Eve Anderson. I am a manager at Google. I have been a practicing software engineer as well as a technology entrepreneur. And as you can imagine, I've interviewed and hired many software engineers, and I've felt that shortage in talent. I still feel that shortage in talent. As an example of how hard it is to find software engineers, Ars Digita was a company that I co-founded back in the 90s, and we were offering a prize of a Ferrari sports car for anybody who could refer 10 software engineers to us. And guess who won the prize? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody was able to find 10 good software engineers to refer to us. Why is it so hard to find software engineering talent? There are two main problems. One is that graduates from computer science programs typically are not prepared to meet the needs of industry. And the second is that there's simply not enough computer science graduates. If computer science graduates do not meet the needs of industry, that means that companies need to spend one to two years training them, and they can't or won't pay them as much as they would if the graduates were fully up to speed. Now, I have a lot of respect for traditional computer science programs, for the faculty, for the students, for the research that's accomplished there. But, in my opinion, the graduates from these programs are usually better suited to be computer science researchers than to be practicing software engineers. The second problem I mentioned is quantity. In fact, there are fewer computer science graduates today than there were 25 years ago. About 10 years ago, I had the honor of helping to design and develop a computer science program at Newmont University. Newmont University is a computer science university in Salt Lake City that has been recognized by the US Department of Education for its innovation. I was in charge of academics at Newmont University from its inception through the first graduating class. And I would like to share with you some of the lessons learned from that experience. So my goal is to help you, educators, design and develop programs that teach people to become the type of software engineers that companies want to hire so that we can address this global shortage but also, selfishly, I'd love to hire a few of your great graduates. But what's in it for you? Why go through the time and the expense of redesigning your computer science program? Well, it can help you achieve high placement rates. Newmont University students, for example, last year, had a 96% placement rate. And high placement rates can help you attract even more excellent students to your university. So today, 
I'd like to talk about designing a computer science program. We'll start with the end goal. What is the ideal graduate? What skills and talents should they have? And then we can work backwards from there to talk about how to design a program that will help develop these skills in the students. So, an ideal software engineer. If our goal is to teach people to become the type of software engineer that companies want to hire, then we have to have a very clear understanding of what's important to them. And how do you know what's important to them? Well, you ask them. At Newmont University, we spoke with dozens of companies, with large multinational software firms, with firms in other industries, such as healthcare, finance, companies that hire many software engineers. And we also spoke with a number of software startup companies. And from that, we were able to develop this complete picture of what's important to them in a software engineer. The ideal software engineer has a very strong grounding in computer science theory, in algorithms, data structures, machine learning. She is able, or he, is able to speak with the client and take the client's ambiguous wishes and turn it into a set of requirements for software that can actually be built. She is able to write code or computer programs to build the software, but just as importantly, she can architect the system. She can determine what are the pieces that the software needs to have and how do they interconnect. The software that she creates, it's well tested. It's free of bugs or errors. It's easy to use. It does everything that she has promised to the client. But she doesn't do this alone. She does this as part of a team and she's excellent at collaborating with her team members. She shows leadership. She's able to communicate well with the clients, with her colleagues. And when her software is done, she is able to stand up and give a demo of her software in front of the board of directors. All in all, we uncovered about 300 different competencies that a good software engineer has. Everything from the hard skills such as algorithms through the soft skills such as being able to deliver presentations. And once we had this set of competencies, we were able to embark on designing the program. So let's talk about designing the program, the ideal computer science program. The first question is who? Who should be involved in designing it? I recommend involving three different types of people, instructional designers, traditional computer science faculty, and practicing software engineers and managers of software engineers. Instructional designers understand learning theory. They know how to design programs that help people learn. Traditional computer science faculty have a very strong grounding in the theory and are able to teach that theory upon which the more practical software development knowledge can be built and practicing software engineers understand how to work with real clients and deliver projects and work in a collaborative business environment. The next question is, how do you structure the program? How do you teach students to build real software, real users, real data, real clients with ambiguity and changing needs? by standing in front of them and lecturing at them with PowerPoint slides? No, or not entirely. Project-based learning is the answer. Project-based learning from the beginning. Lecturing students for three and a half years and then having a capstone project or an internship at the end is not project-based learning. Imagine you're teaching a child to speak, and the child has to learn 
a complete set of grammar, vocabulary, uh, pronunciation before they are even allowed to utter a word. That's not a good way to learn. The child needs to try and practice and sometimes fail. And so do students. And so do adult learners. I believe that knowledge transfer should occur via both push and pull mechanisms. Push is a transfer of knowledge from the expert to the novice, from the professor to the student, even from the more advanced student to the student who has yet to master the concept. Pull, on the other hand, is when the goal or the project inspires the student to acquire the knowledge, to do the research, to ask the questions. The role of the professor in this case becomes less of a lecturer and more of a mentor. Projects should become incre increasingly more complex as time goes on. They can start out as simple projects that are designed, that don't have clients, but they're designed to teach specific technologies, the integration of those technologies, working in a group, in a project environment. But soon they should transition into more complex, real projects with real clients and real users. And how do you get these real projects? By partnering with industry. The thing that your industry partners need to know is these do have to be real projects with real users. Otherwise, they are just throwaway exercises like any other. An example of a real project from Newmont University, the students built an application for police officers to use. It's a smartphone application where the police officers have access to their police databases on their phone. Imagine if you're a police officer. It's a lot more useful to have the description of the suspect in a case on your phone where you're up and about and you can actually do something about it as opposed to sitting in your police car with a laptop. So that's an example of a real project. And as you can see, there's a lot at stake in this project. The students have to get it right. Third, assessment. Assessment becomes a lot more difficult, more complex, but also more valuable in this environment. Assessment, the, the project needs to be assessed based not just on the outcome of the project, but also on the achievement of the learning goals, including the, the technical goals, but also the soft skills. Peer feedback can help, as can client feedback. And in a way, the assessment is a lot more like a corporate performance review than it is a traditional report card. And it can be very valuable for the student's future learning and development. So we're working our way backwards through this topic. We started with the end result, the ideal students, and then we talked about how to structure the program. So what's missing from this? The input to the system, the students. So how do you know what students to admit? What students will have the characteristics to become a world-class software engineer? Well, we didn't know at Newmont University, like many admissions committees, we sat in a closed room, myself included, looked at the applications, test scores, etc., and made our best guess on who could become a good software engineer. But after a few intakes of students and students having progressed to various stages in the program, we were able to use the data. And so we did a statistical analysis of 38 different factors that we were able to pull from the application test scores, grades, math courses taken, computer science courses taken, work experience, leadership experience, you name it, 38 different factors. And the results were a little bit surprising to us. We found that while the traditional things, such as 
um, such as test scores and grades do matter, the things that really mattered were the admissions essay, the quality of the essay. Secondly, mathematics level attained. We found that if students hadn't at least gotten through trigonometry level in high school or secondary school, then they were unlikely to succeed in the program. And third, this was surprising to us. We thought that prior computer programming experience would help, but it made no difference. What did make a difference was when people were heavy users of computers, if they were comfortable using technology. And then we were able to teach all of the computer science theory and practice from scratch. So we now have a fairly complete picture in some ways. We have the end goal, the ideal software developer with their combination of technical skills and soft skills. We have the program structure itself, including the faculty, the project-based learning, assessment, and we've spoken about admissions. Who's the ideal student who has the potential to become a great software engineer? But that's only part of the story. Learning is a lifetime endeavor. And corporate trainers can use the exact same principles that I talked about to, developing, to develop continuing learning and development programs for their employees. In fact, at Google, in addition to my day job as a manager, I am working using these principles on defining learning programs for employees in our department to continually develop their skills. But what's even more important is encouraging young people, especially young women, to become interested in computer science and nurturing that interest via project-based learning. You, educators, are the key component in this equation. You have the power to nurture an interest in computer science. You have the power to develop excellent software engineers, and in doing so, make the world a better place. Educators, use that power. Thank you very much.